on YouTube. Um, if you have any visitors, any first time visitors with us today, we do acknowledge you. And our prayer is that you feel the presence of the Lord right where you at and he meets you in the way that's needed. Amen. Our announcements this morning is the following. We do have our tithes and offering ways to give, tithes and offering, um, as well as we do have Amazon Smile. I will go a little bit more with the Amazon Smile. You just need to make sure that you are actually on Amazon Smile, just at the center of Amazon. Select Bethel Worship Center International for your charity of choice. Make sure that the items that you're shopping for is eligible for a gift back. The only thing else you need to do is just um, continue to shop and check out. Amazon will donate a proceed of your givens to Bethel Worship Center International or your charity, char charity of choice. We do have noonday prayer. That is Monday through Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time. The phone number and access code can be found on our website as well as all of our social media platforms. Food Pantry is open every Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. No restrictions or requirements. The only thing we ask is that if there's a need, you just come out to be um, sold into. Amen. Please spread the word. We know with COVID, a lot of the elderly are deciding to not come out. So if you have elderly neighbors, family members, friends, um, you're able to come and pick up for them as well. Um, join us for corporate prayer, which is Thursdays at 6.30 a.m. Again, that phone number access code can be found on our social media platforms as well as the website. And then if you have any questions, if you need someone to talk, if you need someone to pray with you, we ask that you do not hesitate to contact us. Um, if there is a need that we're unable to assist you with, still contact us and we'll make sure that we can provide you with that resource. This does conclude our announcements for today. At this time, I will turn it over for a word of offering.
first time since we're back in the building that I got to preach. So it's the first time I've preached in a while where I got to look out and see faces. Yeah. So I want y'all to do me a favor this morning. I want y'all to give God the biggest glory, hallelujah, clap of praise you possibly can. And just praise his name. For a Humility. 
Having low self-esteem is not being humble. And again, that is self-deprecation. It is not lowering your own view of yourself. It is not a belief that you are not important. It is a perspective that you have. I can stand up here and say, well, I'm an idiot, thinking that that's in some way being humble. Because if I say, hey, I, I think I'm a pretty smart guy, oh no, well now that's pride that I'm not being humble, so I need to take the opposite extreme of that and call myself a moron so I can be humble. That is not humility. But I've got good news. We're talking about three different things when we talk about each thing. Like this week we're talking about humility. So if I had to give this a title, I would say humility. There's an app for that. <laughs> Here's the app. Your attitude, your position, and your posture. Okay? So if we start with attitude, having an attitude of humility is living in such a way that finds grace and blessing in submitting to God's will. This starts by acknowledging what Christ did on the cross for us. We do not deserve what he did for us, and he did not deserve the punishment for our sins. But he still did it for us. Who are we to put ourselves on a pedestal? Now, thinking yourself more important, or having the opinion that you are in any way, shape, or form more important or better than anyone else is when you get into pride. Now, personally, I, I don't care about titles, okay? Um, whether you're the janitor, the usher, the president, whatever, okay? You have reached that position, God has put you into that position. But how many of y'all know that every single person in the body of Christ is important to God? Okay, when we talk about humility, we're not talking about what's important to you. Oh, well, I don't really talk to that person anymore because they can't do nothing for me. Well, you know, I don't really talk to the people that are entry-level workers at my job because becoming friends with them is not going to help me advance my career at all. When we start to get those attitudes, when we start to get those beliefs, what we're essentially saying is, I am more important than you, therefore, I do not need to talk to you because there's no benefit to me. How many of y'all know tomorrow God can take you out of the position you're in and give it to that other person? How many of y'all know that that person that you think you're better than today could be your boss tomorrow? And even if they're not, we still can't devalue people. See, because God did not die on the cross for people of equal importance to him. That's good. When Jesus was on the cross, he did not look out and say, this is not for you. This is for everybody who's like me. So why do we adapt that mentality over the years? Why do we get to the point where our attitudes become that which says, I'm better than these people? And, and the worst part of it is, is we think that we're still coming at it with humility because we put ourselves down in it. You know, or the person that says, you know, nobody can say anything was given to me. I worked hard my whole life for everything that I have. Now, that's not necessarily being prideful, but we need to change that attitude, too, and say, I've worked hard all my life, and I've been faithful, so God has blessed me with the stuff that I have. Because mm -hmm. how many of y'all know, no matter what you drive or where you live, tomorrow, things could be a lot different. Mm -hmm. We have what we have because of who he is, not because of who we are. God places an equal importance on every single person. Yeah, the scriptures tell us that he gave some to be prophets, some to be apostles and pastors and teachers and 
all that other stuff. Those people have a different anointing. They don't have a different importance. You know, I may be the one standing up here speaking this morning, but I'm no more important than Mike running sound, or Eric is singing, or somebody on Zoom sitting in a room watching. It's not about the importance. And the best example, in my opinion, that we have of this in Scripture is Paul. Now, I'm going to go through a lot of Scriptures here, and I'm not going to ask Mike to keep up because they all kind of say the same thing. Galatians 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and, the God, and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his salutation to the churches in Galatia. Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi and with the overseers and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all starting to see a pattern here? 1 Corinthians, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Now I'll tell y'all something. Paul was a bad dude. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Paul they say is single-handedly responsible for reaching 75% of that area with the gospel of Christ. Paul could have walked in anywhere and been like, yo, I'm Paul. You all know me. You know who I am. You know what I do. Let's go. How many times did Paul do that in the New Testament? Not a single one. Paul does not introduce himself based off of his own accomplishments. He introduces himself based off of his calling. See, Paul has an attitude of humility. Now, I can come in here and be like, hey, my name is Tom. I've been saved for such and such years. I've read this book and this book, and this is what I do at work, and this is who I am. And I can give you my resume. But here's the honest reality. I'm up here for one reason and one reason only. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with my accomplishments. It has nothing to do with what I do at work. It has nothing to do with my level of education. It has nothing to do with my intellect. It has nothing to do with my financial status. It has nothing to do with anything of this world. What it has to do is with me spending quiet time with God, alone, by myself, and God calling me to teach and preach. And my first response to that was, <laughs> nope. You got the wrong God. That's not me. But again, I say, I'm not up here because of who I am. I'm up here because of who he is and the calling that he's placed on my life. When we develop an attitude where we do everything that we do because it's what God tells us to do, then we can take a look at different, we can look at things a lot differently. When we truly get that attitude, and I'm not talking about the fake attitudes. Okay, let's just get this out of the way. We all been in church long enough, we know how to fake things. We can fake a smile. We know what part of the song we're supposed to raise our hand, what part of the song we're supposed to clap, what part of the song we're supposed to say hallelujah. We know how to do all the Christian things. We know how to do the Christian speaking. Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. I've been cleansed by blood. People outside the church talk about they take blood baths. <laughs> We all know how to do all those things. We know when to do those things to make ourselves 
look a certain way or make people think a certain way. You know, they say one of the biggest lies ever told on Sunday mornings is in response to the question, how are you doing? And the answer is, I'm fine. Or doing good, or blessed and highly favored. That's a lie most of the time. Most of the time, most of us aren't completely fine. Most of the time, we all got so many things going on inside our mind, we're lucky we were able to find our way to church that morning. Sometimes we got so much going on in church that morning that we don't have time to say hi to a single person. Or we get so caught up in the things that are going wrong, we forget to look at the things that are going right. I'm going to tell you all the secret this morning. Wasn't worship good? That's not the secret. Y'all want to know the secret? How many of y'all know that that last song was the wrong one? Oh, wow. <laughs> See, we could have focused on that. Erica could have stood up here and been like, yeah, 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 stop. Wrong song, buddy. Play the right one. And that would have broken the spirit that was flowing at that time. It would have, it would have caused an interrupt in the worship. But see, because we have people that act in humility, there wasn't no calling out. It was, oh, hey, this is... This isn't the right song, but maybe it's the song that God wanted. Let me grab my phone and get the right lyrics so that I can sing the song. See, when we place the importance of God over the importance of ourselves, when accidents happen or things happen that are beyond our control, rather than using those as stumbling blocks, we, we think of them as maybe this is what God wanted the whole time, and we flow with it. Right. See, having an attitude of humility allows you to flow with the Spirit and not get bogged down by the things that are not happening the way you plan them to. Now, I'm not saying that our worship team does not pray about what songs to play. I'm pretty sure they do. But what I'm saying is, God can change anything at any time for any reason. And we have to have that attitude of humility to be able to flow with it without it becoming a distraction or a disruption to us. For all but three people in this room, y'all had no idea that we were playing a song that wasn't intended. And just stayed in that attitude of worship. It was only three of us that saw Erica's eyes get real big. <laughs> a couple people grabbing their phones to make sure. <laughs> but having that attitude of humility means that the little things don't bother you as much because you can flow. Now, I'll be the first one to admit there's a lot of times where everything is going wrong on a Sunday morning and I'm back behind that soundboard and I do not have an attitude of humility. I've got the attitude of frustration all over me. I'm not going to stand up here and say that I am perfect at this. Our first Sunday back in this church, we came out here the week before and we set everything. We spent hours here making sure that every dial was turned to the correct location, every plug was plugged all the way in, that everything was working fine. And when I got here Sunday morning, nothing worked. There were wires in the wrong place. Nobody touched the soundboard between when we set it all up and when we got here Sunday morning. You tell me how a wire gets in the wrong place. It means somebody doesn't want us to worship. And I got caught up in the spirit of frustration that day because I did not get everything fixed until one minute before service started. But we worshiped anyway. The frustration went away. Everything fell into place the way that it was supposed to fall into place. If I had that attitude the whole time, yeah, it might have still been frustrating, but maybe I wouldn't have been slept as much. If I just said, okay, God, I, I know that 
This is a situation that we have. Just give me the strength to get through it. Maybe we'd have got through it quicker. See that attitude. How many of y'all gotta check your attitude every day? If you if you got your hand down, then be honest with yourself. Because we all gotta check our attitudes. Yeah. Now, the second thing is the position. And I'm going to talk about position from multiple different perspectives because I think it's important that we apply a position of humility to every single one of these areas of our lives. First of all, I'm going to step on toes. Y'all okay with me stepping on toes? Okay. If your position is based on anything political, moral, topical, or religious, then you are wrong. Everybody catch that? If your position is based on things that you find to be political, moral, topical, or religious, you are wrong. I don't very often say those words from behind here because that sounds kind of harsh. Okay? Your position... I'll get to that in a second. When we base our actions on talking points or political parties, or singular topics, whether they be moral or religious topics. You can be religious and be completely not humble. Ask the Pharisees, they'll tell you. A lot of times, we define our position by these things. And I'm not trying to start debates, I'm not trying to cause anybody any discomfort. But how many of y'all know right now, you cannot open up a Facebook feed without seeing the world's biggest debate between Democrat or Republican or COVID is fake versus COVID is real or vaccinated versus unvaccinated. People are so fired up about these topics. And I'm not just talking about in the world, I'm talking about in the church too. I see it from both sides in the church. People are so fired up about this. At the end of the day, does it matter? It's like there's an old adage that says, you know, a husband and wife are standing there arguing about a snake in the house and who let the snake in. And they go back and forth for hours and hours and hours arguing over who let the snake in. But the sad reality is the fact that the snake is still in the house. Right now, this country is arguing about should you get vaccinated, should you not get vaccinated, should you do this, should you do that. The fact is we still have a pandemic. Right. Right. Okay, and for those of you that are like, well, there's only a 2.1% chance that you're going to get it, a 2.3% chance that you'll die from it, which means you only have a 0.002% chance to stop. <laughs> stop. There is a pandemic. It is not just affecting people's lives. It is affecting the entire financial system. And as Christians, we're called to do one thing. And no, I'm not going to say, get this or get that. Pray. Yeah. In this situation, if we have a position of humility, what that means is that all of that other stuff, we set aside. Uh -huh. And we set our position up to pray. We set our position up to pray for this nation, pray for unity, pray that this pandemic will go away. I don't care what the percentages are. Because at the end of the day, if one person is dying from the pandemic, then we need to pray about it. You know, we pray for a lot of things. We pray about cancer. We pray about heart disease. We pray about all kinds of different sicknesses. You know, Back when, how many of y'all remember SARS? How many of y'all old enough to remember SARS? Okay, a couple of us. What was the first thing they did when SARS came out? Global lockdown. Did everybody go into a panic saying that this was just some conspiracy? Yes, yeah, some people did. Some people are always going to have that opinion. But the bottom line is we prayed. The church prayed. You know, about every hundred years there's a pandemic that goes through and it happens. 
There's always going to be new challenges and new things that are going to come up. There's always going to be something that happens that challenges us either politically or morally. But the bottom line is if we are in a position of humility, then it helps us to not take sides. But to pray for the root of the issue rather than attacking those that disagree. Now let's talk about another position. What about your position at work? What about your position at home or at church or in your social circle? Do, do you let that define your position? Oh, well, I'm, I'm pretty, as far as designers go, I'm, I'm pretty far up. So I'm more important than others. Nope. Or at home, yeah, I gotta talk about at home. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm going to go there. <laughs> At home, my wife and kids are supposed to submit to me. Let's go. I said it, you do it. What? Wrong. What about a church? Well, see, I'm a minister. Y'all don't have to care whether or not what I say is in accordance with the scriptures. I said it. Right? I'll say no, no. Because you know what? The leaders in the church are human too. Mm -hmm. We make mistakes. We get things wrong from time to time. If your church leaders ever say anything that does not line up with the word of God, do me one favor. In private, yeah. tell them. Like, hey, you said something, I don't necessarily think that was right. Can you explain it to me, or can we talk about this? Because I'm going to tell you, I've been to a lot of things where people have said things because it's what felt right at the time. We can't do that. What about in your social circle? I know everybody got social circles. And a lot of times, and we do this subconsciously, we, we rank, we rank our friends. Don't we? Well, see, I like this friend more than I like this friend. This friend is more important than this friend, or maybe you feel that you're the most important friend, and if you weren't in that friendship circle, then that friendship circle falls apart. Why not focus on just being friends? Rather than who's more important in the group. See, all of these positions that I just talked about are often defined by our environment. They're based on our surroundings. They're based on our upbringing. They're based on all the things that are going on in our lives. Here's how we do this differently. We need to start adopting positions that define our environment. See, rather than letting our environment dictate our position, let our position dictate our environment. You know, we've used the example before, are you a, are you a thermometer or a thermostat? See, because a thermometer can just tell what the temperature is, but a thermostat sets it. Yeah. And when we're talking about being humble and we're talking about putting ourselves in a position of humility, then we need to be in a position where our position defines our environment. How many of y'all lost friends when you got saved? How many of y'all now have unsaved friends? What about those friends you lost when you got saved? Bye. See, your position started to define your environment. Like, I got a lot of unsaved friends, and you know, they don't mind me talking about God at all. In fact, over the years, a couple of them have given their lives to Christ. We're called to love on people. We're not called to love on Christians. We're called to love on people. Everybody. We'll step on more toes. You okay if we step on more toes? Okay. We're called to love on everybody. That person you hate at work. Yeah, them too. That person that supports the LGBTQ community at work. Yeah, them too. We're called to love on people. Christ did not die for Christians. 
He died for the world. Yet when we get saved, we think that we need to separate or pull away from the world so far that we just look at the world and be like, okay, that person's going to hell, that person's going to... Y'all see where I'm going with that? That is not what Christ taught us to do. If you never interact with somebody that's not saved or you don't like anybody that doesn't follow your beliefs, how in the world do you ever expect to be able to reach anybody that is not saved? When you jump on Facebook and you post your latest political position, what you're effectively doing is you're saying, I do not feel like I need to minister to those that disagree with me. I want you all to hear that again. When you post your position on a topic that is highly divisive, what you are saying is, I do not need to minister to those that disagree with me. Because when you post that position, the people that disagree automatically have their guard up. Mm -hmm. And when they start to have their guard up, no matter what you're talking about, they got their guard up. If we come at it from a position of humility, we can talk to anybody about anything. Mm -hmm. See, people confuse humility with weakness all the time, but humility is actually a strength. It takes a lot more effort for me to not post my opinion than it would for me to post my opinion. Because we all have opinions, right? And some of us are very passionate about our opinions, especially with some of the stuff going on today. Now, there is a people group that I can talk about on this one because they're wrong anyway. I'm going to use this as an example. We're going to talk about flat earthers, okay? Their position is that the earth is flat surrounded by a glacial wall. I love those people, too. I respectfully disagree wholeheartedly, but if you've ever talked to somebody that believes that, man, do they believe it. We cannot discount other people's opinions. We just don't need to argue with them. You know, the, the way that we approach people, by us not jumping in with our opinions, takes strength, takes self-control. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit, right? It takes patience. That's, a, that's another one of the gifts of the Spirit. It takes a lot more work. Now, this may not be true for everybody, I know it's true for me. It takes a lot more work for me to just keep quiet than it would to tell somebody I think they're wrong. See, it is the position that you live your life with a perspective that you do not have it all together and that you have to rely on God and Him alone for your strength. That's what a true position of humility is. Humility isn't putting yourself down it's saying, hey, I don't have it all together. If we take a look at just the term, oh, he got humbled because he got exposed. If we were truly operating out of a position of humility, there's nothing to expose. I know I'm not perfect. If I ever do say or act in any way, shape, or form that makes me feel like I'm perfect, do me a favor. Trip me in public. <laughs> make me stumble. You know why? Because I don't ever want to stand up here and make y'all think that I am perfect. I did not walk across the James River to get here this morning. Okay? I drove. Okay? I am not walking on water or anything else. Like I am not Jesus. I am trying to be more and more like him every single day. But we are human. We all have faults. For somebody to get up in front of you and act like they have it all together, they do not. Even right now, in my mind, it's taking an absurd amount of concentration for me to even be able to deliver the word this morning because I got a lot of things going on. 
I've got all these distractions that are trying to come in and interrupt my thought process to try to get me to not think about what it is I'm supposed to be thinking about right now. Put yourself in a position of humility. I don't have it all together. I'm not perfect. That's not self-deprecating. That's being honest with yourself. And you don't have to take my word for this. Look at the scriptures. David. David was called to be a king. After David was called to be a king, did he walk around acting like a king? No. He walked around acting like a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Tends to the flock. He was tending his sheep. He continued with that same attitude and position of humility. Yeah, I may be called to be a king, but my flock is what's most important. I may be called to be a preacher, but the flock is what's most important. See, that's what I love about Pastor Herman. Pastor Herman stands up here every week and the thing that he cares about the most every single time he stands behind this podium is who he's looking at. Not his own image. How many of y'all have ever seen a speaker speak where it almost feels to you as if they just have a mirror in front of them and they are just talking to hear themselves talk because that's the only reason they do it? Oh, I'm preaching this morning because I like to hear myself. And I want to know what I'm going to say today. Those are the really feel-good messages that often come across because you want people to like you. Everything that you do is for your own position. It's for your own image. When a pastor is not afraid to get up in front of you and say, okay, these are the flaws that we deal with. Let's start addressing them. How does the church grow? How do we become the people that God has called us to be if we never talk about those things? If you don't believe me, you can take it from Joseph. Joseph was told he was going to be in a position of great power. Then what happened? Brothers tried to kill him. And then one of his brothers was like, maybe we shouldn't kill him. Let's sell him. Just kill him, please. <laughs> you know, it's this is a man who was called to be in a great position, and now he became a slave. Did he look at people and be like, no, I'm called to greatness. Like, dude, you're wearing tattered clothes and chains. How are you called to greatness? His position and his attitude lined up, so no matter what situation he was in, he knew where his calling was. And he acted accordingly. The third thing is our posture. And again, I'm going to talk about this from different... I'm not talking about, okay, the back is 90 degrees. I've got my shoulders back a little bit. All right, cool. Now I'm not going to have back problems. <laughs> I'm talking about posturing. Y'all got to bear with me for a moment. How many of y'all act the same at work, home, and at church. Nobody's got their hand up. Okay, we got one. I'll put my hand up halfway. Okay, just, just halfway. See, because if I acted the same way at home that I acted at work, it would get me in trouble at home. When I'm at work, I carry a lot of responsibility, so I gotta act like I carry a lot of responsibility at work. There's a, there's a business me, and then there's the other me. Okay, now I choose to bring that other me into church as well. Because I don't ever want to walk in here and think of this as a job, because this isn't a job. But see, by nature, we posture all the time. We act certain ways in situations to convey who we are. We carry, our say, we carry ourselves in the way in which we would like to be perceived. 
Having a posture of humility can best be described in Luke chapter number 18, verse number 14. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, when I say that I carry myself differently as far as professionalism is concerned at work, I need you all to understand that that does not mean that I carry myself in such a way that says that I'm more important than anybody else. Because I'm not. Okay, I could list my accomplishments, I could give you my resume, and you could look at my resume and say, oh, well, maybe you are. Everything on that resume is something that God has done in my life. And recognizing that, and recognizing that God can do that for anyone at any time, at any point, anybody can be at the same position that I'm in. It doesn't matter what my position is. I can be the president and CEO. But if I walk around and act like I'm the president and CEO, get me out of that position. Because what happens a lot of time in leadership is leadership forgets what it's like to be in the trenches with people. And once you start to forget what that's like, then you have lost touch with the community that you oversee or the community that you have responsible, responsibility for. If a preacher gets up and doesn't remember what it's like to not be saved or to struggle, one, they're lying, and two, they now have a disconnect with the people that they're trying to reach. Somebody walked through that door this morning a little bit stressed out. Probably more than one somebody. I know it's more than one somebody because I was one of those somebodies. Okay, I know what it's like to be stressed out. I know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. I know what it's like to go through this struggle. I know what it's like to be sick. If you look, my, my better half is not sitting here because she doesn't feel good and she didn't want to be in here coughing this morning. I know she's watching on Zoom. Hi, honey. But, you know, I draw strength from my family. I don't think I'm above them. I draw strength from you guys. The first thing I had you guys do was give a shout to the Lord because that feeds me. See, when we separate ourselves and we take on a posture that gets away from humility, we start to place the trust in ourselves. When we have that posture, it leads to an inaccurate view of others. See, Pastor Hermes says all the time, he says, it's funny that we, we judge other people based off of their actions and we judge ourselves based off of our intentions. See, that is the opposite of having a posture of humility. Um, I was attending a Sunday school class one time and the man that was teaching the class said he loves sinners. The bigger the sinner, the better. Because he knew when that person got saved, they were going to be even more on fire. Because the change would be even more dramatic, and they'd be lit, ready to go. How many of us get excited over other people's sin? <laughs> He's the only guy that I've ever met that was like, when I meet a sinner, I want to meet a good sinner. I don't want to talk to the sinner that thinks they got it all together. I want to talk to the sinner that knows they don't. That's an interesting posture. But let me tell you, that man does not have an inaccurate view of other people. This message, or this passage, going back to Luke 18, 14, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. It encourages us to humble ourselves and trust in God to get an accurate picture of who we are. And this is why I, I said so many times at the beginning of this message, humility is not self-deprecation. It is defining your identity based on the way that God sees you. The way God sees you is that you are beautifully, wonderfully made, that you are created by him, that he has given you your purpose. Everything that you think is negative in your life is a positive to God. I cannot stand public speaking. God called me to be a preacher and a teacher. The reason God did that to me is because he knew that meant that I would have to call on him each and every single time I did this. 
I can't even put a message together without sitting with some headphones on with praise and worship music blaring for about an hour just to get me into an atmosphere in my own mind that allows me to hear from him enough to try to put something on a piece of paper. Okay? God knew that about me. So he called me to do something that he knew I would have to rely on him for the strength to do. I could have just been like, nah, God, you got to pick something I'm good at. But what does that do? What that says then is I can do this on my own strength. Who don't ever get up here and think you can preach on your own strength. Don't ever try. You will learn humility. I'm going to pick on Brother Mike for a second. Some of y'all don't know this about Brother Mike. I'm going to tell you a secret. <laughs> Brother Mike hates speaking in public too. But he hates speaking in public because he used to have a lisp. Or a stutter. I'm sorry. He used to stutter a lot. How many of y'all have ever heard Brother Mike stutter? A couple of you. How many of y'all have ever heard Brother Mike stutter up here? Not a single one. <laughs> Now see, Brother Mike says, I, I can't do that, I, I gotta stutter, but I've never once heard him stutter because God called him to do something that he has a physical limitation to do, so he also has to trust in God every single time he gets on a microphone. Pastor Herman has to trust in God every time he gets up here. Minister Mary has to trust in God every time she gets up here. Co-pastor has to trust in God. We all have to trust in God every time we get up here because if any one of us ever get up here thinking we're doing it in our own strength, then what we're putting out is only going to be a message for us because we're trying to make ourselves look and feel better to all of you. That's true. Good word, sir. So whatever it is God is calling you to do, adapt a posture that says, okay, God, I can't do this without you. When we start to develop that attitude and that posture, and we start to get an accurate picture of who we are, it also makes us more able to avoid judging other people. See, I'm going to step on toes again. Is that okay? See, a lot of people say, oh, you got to remove the plank from your own eye before you call out the speck of dust in mine. Okay, let's talk about something. There is a difference between judgment and accountability. Amen. Okay, we as Christians, Scripture says, iron sharpens iron. We are called to keep each other accountable. A judgment is a final decision. Okay. When we look at somebody that's deep in the sin, we'll be like, ooh, that person going to hell. That's judgment. That is not our decision to make. It is our, it is our responsibility to love that person into the kingdom. Once they get into the kingdom, we can all grow together. We can be accountable to each other. If you see me slipping up doing something wrong, tell me. I'm not going to be like, oh, stop judging me. We all need to grow. None of us are where we need to be. Hopefully we're on the right path, but nobody's made it yet. It's a lifelong goal to be like Christ. And I just hope that before God decides it's my time, that I've lived a life worthy of having some sort of legacy and entering the kingdom of heaven. I know where I'm going to go when I pass on. Yeah, people will be sad to see me leave. Well, maybe people will be sad to see me leave. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I know where I'm going. I just want to make a difference before I get there. 
and walking around thinking I'm better than everybody else, having the wrong attitude, having the wrong position, and having the wrong posture is not going to make a difference. It could make it worse. See, I start, I didn't, I wasn't born into a saved family. I didn't start going to church until I was old enough to drive. I started going to church when I was 16 years old. The lady that I worked with invited me to church. And I went to church for a couple of years, and then when I got to college, I tried out several different churches, and every single church that I went into made me feel like I was not welcome in that house. So guess what? I quit. I quit trying. Well, if I'm not welcome in God's house, well, the, the bar welcomes me. The party welcomes me. That's where I spent my time. And it wasn't until years later that I came back to, to church. It was the church that drove me away because the attitudes, positions, and postures of the people in the church were wrong. When you have a church that loves every single person that walks through the doors, regardless of whether they're saved or unsaved, regardless of their financial situation, how big their house is, how nice their car is, or any other thing. Some people may even come in, some homeless guy walks into this church right now, he may smell a little bit bad, guess what? Hug him anyway. We gotta love people in the kingdom. Yeah. There is no argument, there is no name calling, there is no posture of anything political that is gonna bring somebody into the house of God. We need to carry ourselves in that way. So the app, the app for that, it's an attitude, a position, and a posture. And we all have the ability to download it. You don't even gotta go to the app store, you don't need 4G LTE, you don't need 5G, you don't need Wi-Fi, you can all download it right now. But it starts with accepting God as your savior. And it's an app that never truly finishes downloading. We have to keep the download going. And how do we keep the download going? By reading our word, by worshiping and praising him, by praying to him and putting all your faith and trust in him to do what he said he would do. To wake up every single day and decide that you are going to continue downloading this app. That you are going to make a choice to develop the attitudes, the position, and the postures that you need to serve him the way that you need to serve him. What'd you think? This morning, if there is anything that you need prayer for, if there's an area in your life where you are struggling, The altar is open for you. If you're on one of the social media platforms, reach out to the church. We will be more than happy to pray with you. But before we do that, I want to make sure that anybody that doesn't know him as their personal Lord and Savior starts by clicking the download button. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer, asking for the forgiveness of my sins. I confess with my mouth and believe with my heart that Jesus is your Son, and that he died on the cross at Calvary, that I might be forgiven and have eternal life in the kingdom. Father, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and I ask you right now to come into my life and be my personal Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and I will worship you all the days of my life because your word is true. I confess with my mouth that I am born again and cleansed by the blood. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now, if you prayed that prayer and you're on any of the social media platforms, please reach out to us. We want to talk to you. If you prayed that prayer and you're in here, please let us know. And if there's any other area in your life where you need prayer, don't hesitate to reach out. God's waiting with open arms. All you got to do is ask. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for speaking through me this morning, and I thank you, Father God, for giving me the words to use. I pray, Lord Jesus, that every single person under the sound of my voice this morning would be able to apply this lesson to their life. That they would be able to look up the scriptures and see, Father God, the attitudes, positions, and postures that you want us to adopt. I pray, Father God, that you would change lives. That you would help us, Father God, to be unified no matter what our political backgrounds are, no matter what our race or issues are, no matter what, Father God, just help us be the body of Christ across the entire nation, Father God. God, we thank you for your word. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And now, God, I ask that you would bless your people that you would give them traveling mercies as they go. That you would look down upon them favorably, Father God, and continue to bless your people. I pray, Father God, that you would give them the strength to live every day for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go enjoy, and enjoy the favor of the Lord.